All right, welcome to the first video in chapter 10. We're talking about really one of the um, major outcomes of a statistics class, an introductory statistics class. It's all about statistical inference. What judgments can you make? What conclusions can you come to? And the first one that we really focused that on was in confidence intervals in the previous chapter. And now we're going to introduce the idea of something called a hypothesis test. And this is used in a lot of research, sometimes overused, uh, but it's a very frequent topic that occurs in a lot of different areas. So we're going to introduce the idea here in section one, and then we will learn um, three different tests in later sections, and we'll talk about a summary at the end of how to distinguish between the two. So in this first section, we're just going to talk about, all right, what is hypothesis testing? What are the null and alternative hypotheses? We'll talk about the couple of errors you can make when you when you do a test and you state a conclusion. Um, and then we'll talk about, okay, when you have a conclusion, you do a statistical test, how do you word your conclusion? What can you actually say? So let's get started. Here's the idea. Uh, this is some research that actually I started a few years ago, and we actually ended up um, changing our placement policy based on this research. So one of the things we were interested in, we we're looking at students in developmental algebra, math 98, intermediate algebra in particular, and wondering how their success depended on their high school GPA. So they were placed into those courses by uh, their math uh, placement test. Maybe you were placed into that class. And the question is, there are obviously a lot of different variables that go into that success. How does high school GPA rate? And so typically that class, if you look at students that were enrolled on the first day, about a little over half of those students pass. It's not great. Um, and so I had a set of data from students who were incoming students, fresh incoming students in fall, 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, there were 88 students who had earned a 3.5 or higher in their high school GPA. Um, and that's on a 4.0 scale. 78 of those were successful. So that's pretty unusual, but you know, is it, does it fit our statistical definition of unusual where it has a, likelihood that's very small, a probability of that happening pretty small. Obviously we'd expect a little over half, that's the 55 percent. So how unusual is that 78? So let's see if we can answer that. So if the proportion really is 55, well we can look at the distribution of the sample proportion. We'd expect the same mean of the sample proportions as the population, and we have the standard deviation formula that we learned in chapter 8 and we used again in chapter 9 in our confidence interval formula would expect a standard deviation of the sample proportions uh, to be about 0 0.05. So um, if we do the test here, I didn't put the math here, but if we do the test, we would expect this distribution to be approximately normal. So we could use the normal distribution now like we did on the test uh, from the last unit or like we did in chapter 8 where we can find the probability of getting a sample proportion of at least 78 over 88. So if we look on the normal distribution, uh, bring my mouse over here, where did it go, there it is. Um, so I've got that mean, I would expect the population mean of 0.55 and the standard deviation, I would expect that standard deviation for the sample proportion. And you can see this probability is so small it hardly even registers. I mean just think about this, 78 over 88, gosh I should know what that is, um, it's got to be almost 9 tenths. So you know, it's got to be 0.8 or 0.9. The standard deviation is 5%. So we are many standard deviations. We are way off over here. That's 78 over 88. That probability is basically zero. It's so small, we won't even say it. We'll just say it's less than one in 10,000. So if we did 10,000 random samples of 88 students, less than one of those 10,000 samples of 88 students would have a success rate of 78 over 88. So that is really, really unusual. Yes, that is very unusual. So what's the point of that? Well, what you might say then is, boy, those students probably have a much higher likelihood of being successful in that class, um, much higher than the overall distribution. And in fact, this is what actually led to us changing our placement policy. We now allow those students because they're so likely to be successful, um, we said, you know what, just skip that class. Let you take uh, college algebra or math 104, math 102, those entry-level um, entry 
college math classes. So um, we just found that those that that population, the particular population, that sample couldn't have happened just randomly. Something different was about those students. Their probability of success was probably much much higher than average than the other students, and so. That was what caused us to change our plan. So this is the idea behind hypothesis testing. We have some things we assume. So we assumed back here, we, just, we assumed the proportion was 55%. We assumed that was the probability of success. And so under those assumptions, how likely is what we observed? And if we observe something really unusual, well, then what we assumed is probably not true. And so that's the idea behind hypothesis testing. So some vocabulary here. We have the null and alternative hypotheses. So the null hypothesis is what we assumed to be true. So that was that we assumed the proportion of students uh, succeeding would be 55%. We assumed it be the same as the other students. The alternative hypothesis, um, sometimes H1 or H sub A, depending on the textbook that you're using or that you're looking at, is what we are testing. So in this case, we think the probability of success is being more than that, is being uh, greater than 0 0.55. So if we look at our previous example, there actually are two mistakes that could have made if you think about this. So we decided, no, those students are probably much more likely to be successful. So there's, there's two ways that we could be wrong. One is we could say that those students were more likely to be successful, but really it was just one of those one out of 10,000, or actually it's less than that, right? It's like one out of a, a billion or something. But anyway, that's possible. We could have just observed a really, 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 really unusual sample. That's possible. The other error is we could have, you know, maybe we just made, maybe a different calculation was made and we said, nope, those students really are the same. Um, they're, they're, they're not more likely to be successful. Uh, and really they are more likely to be successful. So there's two mistakes we can make. We could either say they were more likely to be successful, um, but really they weren't and it was just a random occurrence. Or we could not say they more, were more likely to be successful and they actually were. So those two types of errors are called a type one error for the first type where we don't say anything, uh, but we should have. And a type two error is when, um, oh sorry, type one is when we say something we say something is true, that there's this unusual occurrence that they're different, but they're actually not. And then type two is when we don't say anything, but we should have. So we, we just leave the status quo, but the status quo actually isn't true. Type one and type two. So type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis, stating those students are different, um, when really the null hypothesis is true, we shouldn't have. And so type two then is the other error not rejecting the null hypothesis, saying, well, the status quo is just true, uh, when really we should have rejected the null hypothesis. We should have said that there's a greater probability of success for those students. Uh, some notation, we let the probability of a type one error be alpha, and you may recognize that alpha, that's the same alpha that we used in uh, the confidence interval, it's the same alpha we use for z sub alpha, all those things are connected, they're very connected ideas. In this context, we call alpha the level of significance. Uh, for future reference, we let the probability of a type 2 error be beta. Uh, and that's a, an investigation that we could do in this class, um, but we just choose not to. It's usually left for a higher course, and just because of time issues, we don't have time to investigate it. It's much more complicated to, um, to really understand we'd probably just get to a point where we could memorize some steps here, but we wouldn't really understand what it is, so there's not a lot of value in that at this level. All right, so let's talk a little bit about errors. Let's look for, look, consider a pregnancy test. Uh, what pregnancy tests do is they look for a particular hormone, this HCG hormone, which is secreted uh, once the fertilized egg implants on a woman's uterus, then uh, her body starts secreting this hormone. Um, throughout her body, but so then that will be in the, the urine then which is tested by uh, the pregnancy test. So the null hypothesis is that she's not pregnant, there's none of this hormone there. And then the alternative hypothesis would be that the hormone is there uh, and so that she is pregnant. So if we think about what could be here, this is kind of a, oh there's a name for this kind of table and now I can't remember it. So the pregnancy test has two outcomes. The pregnancy test could be either positive or negative. Positive means 
something is there or negative. Nope, nothing there. And in reality, it could be two things too. Either in reality, she's not pregnant or she is pregnant. And so there are different things that could be true here. If we look at the test, so it could be positive, um, it could be negative, the same for reality. She could be not pregnant, she could be pregnant. And so we have all these different possibilities where some of those the test could be correct and some of those the test could be incorrect. So if we look at the top right here, if it comes back with a positive test result and she actually is pregnant, then that would be correct. The other po the correct one would be down here in the bottom left. If the test is negative and it says, nope, there's none of this hormone here and she's not pregnant, that also would be correct. And then there are two mistakes. The top left then would be if the test is positive, so it says there is some of the hormone, but in fact, in reality, she's not pregnant. So we rejected the null hypothesis when we actually shouldn't have. So that's type one. And then the bottom one, it was when the test is negative, but she actually is pregnant. And so that one would be the test says, nope, no, state, no change from the status quo, assume the status quo is true, but actually it isn't, actually she's pregnant. So that's the type two error. All right, um, talk about how we word our conclusion. So look at this pregnancy test. Uh, they claim to be, most of them claim to be 99% accurate. So what it means is when we have a, a positive test, it means we're 99% positive that there's enough evidence to support the presence of this hormone. Um, we could be wrong, we're not sure. We're just, if it's 99% correct, um, 99% times out of a hundred if the test is positive it means that she actually is pregnant so we're 99 percent positive that we have enough evidence to support that that presence all right so if we look at how conclusions are generally worded we what we say in general is that we're whatever percent positive that there either is or is not uh, enough evidence to support our alternative so um, if we reject the null hypothesis if we if we observe something that's so unusual that it can't just be coincidence or we're, we're pretty positive it's not coincidence then we say all right we're whatever percent positive and we'll talk about how that percent um, comes about but we're whatever percent positive that there is enough evidence or if we observe something that's maybe a little rare but not extremely unusual then we say no there's we're you know 95 percent positive that there isn't enough evidence to support our claim now here's a technicality just because you don't have enough evidence to support your alternative, like you don't have enough evidence to detect that hormone that she's pregnant, doesn't mean she's not pregnant. It doesn't mean you support the fact that she's pregnant. It just means we don't have enough evidence to say she's pregnant. So when it's it's not a hundred percent, we're definitely that she's not pregnant. So you're either you're looking for evidence to support what you're testing. In the pregnancy test, you're looking for presence of the hormone. So if it's not there, it just means ah, we, we don't have enough evidence to say that she's pregnant. And I don't know if that I don't know if that's clear at all. Hopefully, as we do some examples, it'll kind of make sense. But we always talk about our alternative. In this case, the pregnant the, the uh, pregnancy hormone. Do we have enough evidence to say that it's there, or do we not have enough evidence to say it's there? Um, one final note, um, a few little, actually a few little notes here, but one final slide about hypothesis testing. It's actually controversial because, you know, if I had that, that the proportion of students being successful because of their um, high school GPA, if I had a really large sample, that probability would change. Even if the sample proportion was the same, the probability can change. And so things can look clearer just because of a large sample size. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a stronger result. You just happen to have a large, a larger sample size. Um, just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean that it actually means anything. So let's say we had um, that that um, success in Math 98, and we said there's a 55% chance of success. Um, what if we observe a sample proportion of 57%? And we have a sample size of a thousand. And it turns out that the probability of that happening randomly is really, really small because we had a pretty large sample size. But in a big practical difference. So just because you have a statistically significant test doesn't mean it's actually practically 
significant, that it has any meaning that will help further humanity. Um, here's this last one we just talking about. If you don't reject the null hypothesis, doesn't mean it's true. Could just mean you haven't collected enough evidence. Um, so that's a really important one that you can't just do this test and it's not black or white. Either the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. It's either you think the al alternative hypothesis is true or you don't have enough evidence to say the alternative hypothesis is true. So that's a real weakness. If you're trying to prove the status quo, it's very difficult to do that. Hypothesis testing is really only good to prove a difference from the status quo. Um, repeated tests can be misleading. So I've got a comic here. Let me see if I can get this up. Um, so this is related to this. Uh, this is XKCD, one of the comic strips I, uh, I enjoy. Um, so researchers think that jelly beans cause acne. All right, so let's go investigate. And we found no link between here, between jelly beans. Oh, but we think it's a certain color. Well, we do all these different tests, all these different tests. One test happened to just randomly have a low P that low, a low. We'll talk about what this P is, but random, you know, remember we talk about things can happen randomly. So one color just randomly happens to look like uh, it has a positive test. And then, well, you know, that that's what we report. But really, it could just happen randomly. If 5% if is your threshold, we've been using that for unusual. If you look here, I think there are 20 different are there 20 different colors? So if you test 20 different colors, chances are one of them is just going to randomly appear unusual if 5% is your threshold. So you have to be very careful about looking for like all these different tests and then just pick out the ones that happen to be significant. Um, that's why when you look for research, you actually have to go, and I, I've learned this too, I have to go in with a very specific question that I want to test. I can't look at a hundred different variables and look at which ones happen to be significant. Because if I have a hundred variables, three, four, or five might appear to be significant, but it's just random noise because things happen randomly. They get distributed. If I have a hundred different things, a few of them are going to look extreme. So that's one of the that, that's what we're talking about here, where these repeated tests can be misleading. Uh, I have some links in the online lesson, and you, you're welcome to um, peruse those if you're interested. Don't let anyone in any class later than this tell you that hypothesis testing is the only way to prove something is true and the hypothesis testing is perfect and any other statistical test doesn't have value or you have to have a hypothesis test to have value. None of that's true. We're introducing it because it's a valuable tool, but it is not an infallible tool. Um, and that's a really, really important thing to understand. So that's it for the introduction to hypothesis testing. Check the check uh, the next video. The, the, the easy for me to say. Check the next video um, about uh, in 10.2 where we'll talk about our first hypothesis test regarding a population proportion.